Hi, my name is Katie Griffith. Hi, I'm Caitlin Delmas. And I'm Hannah Barch, and we are all archaeologists here at Jamestown Rediscovery. We are in Smithfield looking for the extent of a known 17th century English burial ground. Welcome to Dig Deeper. We're in Smithfield, which is located between the ridge that the fort was built on and the ridge that the state house was built on. But prior to the state house construction, the ridge behind me was used as an English burial ground from about 1610 to the 1640s. This field historically is referred to as Smith's Field. This is likely a connection back to London where there is a Smith's Field just west of city center. Our approach in this excavation in Smithfield has been a little bit different than everywhere else that we've excavated on the island. And that's because we're worried about the amount of time that these units are open. So we have decided that instead of digging our standard 10 foot by 10 foot squares, we're gonna start by opening five foot by five foot squares to hopefully get an idea of what is happening in this field and the features that are here, uh, but be able to dig them relatively quickly. And if we need to backfill without further damage to the archeology. span this field is prone to flooding during high tides and extreme rain events. Therefore, working in small test units allows for quicker excavation during dry spells. We need to complete these tests across Smithfield in order to determine the southern edge of a 17th century burial ground. While any features we find will be helpful in learning more about Jamestown's past, we are primarily focused on identifying any burials present within these tests. Their presence or absence will be essential in mapping out the boundaries of this burial ground. When we're looking for these burials, what we're really looking for is actually a stain in the soil. So it's going to be above human remains, and it's going to be a different color of dirt than that that's surrounding it because they dug through multiple layers, put the individual in the ground, and then put that dirt back in. So it's a slightly different color of soil, and that's what we're looking for when we're looking for burials. Also, almost none of this field has been excavated before. So generally, we're looking at what did this landscape look like throughout history and how was it used? Last summer, we started with seven 10 foot by 10 foot squares. And in those seven units, we uncovered at least one burial and all but one of those excavation units. We have started to expand from our excavations and this spring we have excavated five of those five foot squares in the center of the field. We chose to start there because it was particularly dry this spring. And those uh, units are at the lowest elevation and flood most often and most severely. We uncovered two historic ditches that are about 30 feet off of known property boundaries. So further research is required to understand how they interact with the greater landscape. We also found two modern utility lines. One is likely a telecommunication line running to the Dale House Cafe. The other utility we knew about prior to excavations because it appears on a 1941 topographic map. It was also recorded by J.C. Harrington in 1938. As a National Park Service archaeologist, he was monitoring this work being done to record any archaeological features or artifacts. Harrington noted that the trench was about a foot wide and a foot and a half deep. He also noted that there was very little brick and mortar flecking, which is very uncommon for plow zone here at Jamestown. He also noted that the utility trench was not wide enough to identify features accurately. Harrington also noted that this utility cut through two burials, one relatively close to the Yardley House, which we confirmed in excavations in 2020, and another relatively close to the Dale House. This is the reason that we picked to do five foot by five foot squares all the way across the field to look for the southern edge of the burial ground. So in terms of stratigraphy in this excavation, we have several layers, including our topsoil, which includes grass and root mat. This upper layer is early 20th century landscaping fill, deposited after Preservation Virginia's property acquisition. The layer below it is plow zone, material turned together by agricultural activity in the area. Due to the long intervals of flooding and water inundation, the upper portion of our plow zone has had its chemical composition changed, thus making it hydric. Now, an interesting thing about our regular plow zone 
is the lack of architectural materials like brick and mortar in this area. Closer to our museum and with our excavations over there, we were finding a lot more brick and mortar. And this is likely due to the fact that our state house was over on that ridge, which was a very large brick building. The lack of the brick and mortar in this area indicates that there likely was not a large brick building in the immediate vicinity. We also have a layer of what we're calling transition. We do not have any intact historic topsoil here, which we call A horizon. However, we do have small spots of what we call E horizon, which is our ancient topsoil. And this is lying directly on top of our subsoil. Despite the lack of architectural materials in our plow zone, we do know that it is indeed plow zone due to the appearance of plow scars in the lower portions of that layer, which crisscross both north, south, and east, west throughout the unit. The material within the plow scar is the same as the plow zone up above it. So now that we have covered the stratigraphy of our excavation area, we want to talk about some of the features that we were finding in this excavation, which we dug during our 2025 field school. Now the first feature that I want to point out here is this post hole here. It is a nice rectangular shape uh, with a nice uh, mold right in here. Now, because this is just a singular post hole, we can't really say what it would have gone to, whether that be a fence line or a structure. But if we wanted to find out what this post hole went to, we would have to further expand our excavations in order to find more post holes. We would need to find at least three post holes uh, because a singular post hole is just standalone and any two post holes make a line. So you really need three in order to really start to be able to tell what this post hole is indicating. We also have two unidentified features in the central portion of our excavation area. One of which is this amorphous charcoal filled feature. And the other is this lighter gray feature that comes into the wall. Now, as of yet, we don't know what either of these features are. However, it is possible that perhaps the lighter gray feature is some kind of ditch. Now, initially, we only had a small portion of this amorphous charcoal feature in the northeast corner of one of our original five foot by five foot units. In order to get a better idea of what this feature was, we did end up expanding our unit out into a full 10 by 10. Now, we did find a piece of Native American ceramic within this feature. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that the feature itself is an indigenous feature due to the fact that we do find redeposited Native American artifacts within colonial contexts. In order to get a better idea of what this feature might be, we would have to take a test section out of it in order to get a larger sample size of artifacts out of it, which would help us in turn to figure more out about this feature. We also have a second post hole within our excavation area. Now, this post hole is not related to the first one due to the size being very different. This post hole is much smaller than the other. The fill is also very different. You can see that this post hole has a lot more charcoal included in the fill. The orientations of these post holes are also different, so we do not think they're related at all. However, similar to our other post hole, we don't really know what this post hole would have been used for. In order to find that out, we would either have to section this and take a section out of it, or we could expand further to find more post holes similar to this one. Now we're gonna be sharing some of the artifacts that have been coming out of these units here at Smithfield. All the artifacts here in front of me are coming out of our plow zone layer. As a result of agricultural plowing, the layer itself and the artifacts within it have been churned up, leading to different fragments of artifacts from across different time periods to be found in the same layer. Now, the artifact density here at Smithfield is much lower than at other areas on the island. Additionally, the fragments of artifacts that we are finding are also smaller than other sites. One possible explanation for this is that this field may have been stripped in order to construct the Confederate Earthenworks in 1861. We are still seeing our typical array of Jamestown artifacts, including 
nails and other iron objects, both European and local pipe fragments, lead, ceramic, slate, and glass. One interesting artifact that we took out of these units was part of a Turk's head pipe bowl. On this fragment, you can see the eye, the eyebrow, and the beginning of the hat. This would have been part of a reed-stemmed pipe beginning manufacturing in Europe in the 1830s. We did find another fragment of this in our East Godspeed unit. The two pieces do not mend, but we now have three pieces of Turk's head pipe in our collection. Another artifact that we found may be part of a paste gem. It is flat on one side and domed on the other. Reading from the domed side, it reads Dr. Franklin. This may have been part of a personal decoration or adornment to a personal item. Hannah mentioned earlier that we pulled a piece of native ceramic out of our charcoal feature within our unit. This is that rim shirt. It is shell tempered. It may have had some sort of a surface treatment on it. We've also been seeing some lithics come out of these units. These two here are parts of projectile points. Because they are broken, they are no longer diagnostic for dating purposes. We have been seeing a higher concentration of native materials coming out of these units and the five by fives that we excavated in the spring. Our next steps here are to backfill our units that we excavated during our 2025 field school and to continue on with our Smithfield project excavating the five by fives across the field. Thanks for tuning in and stay tuned for more discoveries.